Good evening. If you're making your way in, you can go ahead and find your seats, and we'll go ahead and get started for this afternoon. I'll lead us in a word of prayer, and we'll be praying for those who have lost their faith. And then after that, Brother Forrest will come, and he'll give us the word of God on this afternoon. At this time, my friends, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for today. We thank you, my Lord, for waking us up this morning, allowing us to be able to come out, dear Lord, and hear these lessons and be able to apply them to our life. We thank you, Father, for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness and all the blessings that you have showered down upon us. Father, we love you and we adore you. We thank you so much for the sacrifice of your son, King Jesus the Christ. We thank you, Father, for salvation for all of humanity. My Lord, we come before you this evening. We're praying for those who have lost their faith. We pray, my Lord, that you may be able to stir up that passion again in their heart. We pray, Father, they'll regain that hope. We ask that you'll give them the courage and the boldness to come back to the fold, dear Lord. Help them as they struggle with this. We ask, my Lord, that you'll be patient and long-suffering with them. Uh, we know, my Father, that we've been through a lot in these last two years. But, Father, we ask for mercy as they'll be trying to make their way back. And, Father, we pray for us that when our brothers and sisters do return, that we will receive them with loving hearts, that we, Father, will not be condemning them, but we will, Father, just rejoice and bring them back into the fold. Help us, Father, to be patient with them as well. And Father, just continue to lead and guide them as they're struggling with the desire to come back to your home. My Lord, we ask that you'll be with Brother Forrest, who will be coming before us and delivering your word. We pray that you'll crown his head with wisdom and knowledge, that he'll be able to recall those things that he has studied. And Father, that you'll give us the courage to apply these, those things to our life. All these things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. We don't know if it was his only son, but this boy was certainly loved by his father. It started when the boy was about five or six years old. Suddenly, he became unable to talk. If his father was honest with himself, probably at first it was a little bit of a relief from the unending questions of five and six-year-olds. But before long, his father became extremely worried. The silence turned into something quite odd. Every now and then, the boy would stop in his tracks, almost as if he was seized or grabbed by something, and he would start convulsing. He would start foaming in the mouth. He would fall on the ground with a look in his eyes just of terror and apprehension. His father thought maybe something was wrong, Clearly, something is wrong, but maybe he will bounce back. Maybe he'll get over it. Maybe the prayers on his behalf will work. The father became even more concerned when the boy, from time to time, would throw himself face first into water, even though he didn't know how to swim, or throw himself face first onto fires that were being used for cooking or for warmth. The boy's father began to be afraid of the worst case scenario. He had heard stories about other people in their region, in their village, in their towns who had been overcome, oppressed, possessed by unclean spirits. The father might have went to his rabbi at his local synagogue and said, Rabbi, please, can you help my son? Maybe he explained the case to his rabbi and his rabbi said, I don't know what else this could be other than some kind of evil spirit. The father might have said, is there anything you can do? Is there anything anybody can do? My son is innocent. My, my son is helpless. My son doesn't deserve to go through this. The, the rabbi tried what he could, maybe to cast the spirit out of the boy, but it was unsuccessful. 
as time went by, it just became a part of their family life. There's some places they couldn't go. There's some things they couldn't do. And then the boy's father heard about a rabbi, a special rabbi, a rabbi unlike any other rabbi, a rabbi who, when he spoke, spoke with authority, not like the scribes and the lawyers. The, the, the story circulating about this rabbi went as far to say that this rabbi could cast out unclean spirits just with a word. More than that, even this rabbi's disciples, not just the rabbi himself, but the rabbi's disciples, could easily cast out demons and unclean spirits. The boy's father heard that this rabbi was near his house, near his village, that this rabbi was on the top of this nearby mountain. So he took his son, and with a heart full of hope and faith, went to the base of that mountain where some of that rabbi's disciples were and asked them, please, is there any way? This is what happens to my son. He's seized by this unclean spirit. It convulses him. He begins to foam at the mouth. He throws himself into water. He throws himself into fire. Is there anything you can do? And these disciples of this rabbi said, yeah, we've cast out tons of unclean spirits. We've We've cast out tons of demons. This should be no problem. And they began to try on this boy's son, and they tried as hard as they could, and they tried, and they tried, and they tried, to the point that their arms grew tired from trying to cast this unclean spirit out of this boy. They tried so hard, you could see the sweat start to form on their eyebrows, and the scribes and the Pharisees in the crowd began to throw taunts at them. We knew there's nothing you could do. You can imagine, if you were this father, you would begin to lose hope. This was your penultimate hope. There's, there's nothing else you can think of other than maybe this rabbi can do something to help your son. If you were that boy's father, where would your faith be? You've prayed. Your rabbi tried what he could do. A special rabbi who supposedly is the Messiah, his disciples tried what they could do. Finally, the rabbi descended from off the mountain. And as Jesus looked, he saw the crowds gathered there. He saw the argument, and he asked, what's going on? The situation was explained to him by the Father himself. And the Father asks Jesus, please, if there's anything you can do, help my son. Jesus replies, anything is possible for the one who believes. Belief. Something that that father had tried so hard to hang on to, but it seemed like every time he had a glimmer of hope, it was dashed. He didn't know what else to do. He began to cry, and he cries out to Jesus, as recorded for us in Mark chapter 9. He cries out to Jesus with tears in his eyes. He says, I believe. Help my unbelief. This father understood that though he tried to hang on to his faith for all that it was worth, he had seen so much, experienced so much, it seemed so hard to keep believing. But that little bit of faith he had, Jesus expelled the spirit from his boy. Maybe you found yourself in the same situation as this boy's father. You believed but because of what you've experienced, because of what you've gone through, you could cry out the same thing to Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. Maybe not you, but somebody you know. Maybe you know people who are there or have been there or have lost their faith. We're going to look at some Bible verses this evening that I want us to view as almost cities of refuge to flee to and to spend time in. When our faith begins to falter, when our faith feels like it is crumbling, we're going to look at some Bible verses to hopefully help us build an unshakable faith. The first one is Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. And this verse is really the, the verse that is the launching point for all these other verses. This is something that in and of itself might not have very much apologetic value or faith-defending value, but it tells us where to go, where to flee. It tells us that we can successfully go to Bible verses to build our faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, a verse we're familiar with, so then faith comes by hearing, 
and hearing by the word of God. I'm sure you've heard that verse many times, but let's think about really what that means. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, there's a reminder in this verse that as much as you might desire to have faith, as much as you might desire to have an unshakable faith, as much as you might desire to have a strong faith, God desires that for you even more. God knows that it is impossible to please him unless we believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. God knows that better than anybody. And if God loves us and if God wants all people to be saved and no one to perish, as we read about in 1 Timothy 2 and 2 Peter 3, then it makes sense that God would provide us the means, the source, he would provide us what we need in order to have an unshakable faith. He would provide us with what we need in order to have the kind of faith he seeks. Imagine if there was a father of a son and the son really wanted to play football. And the father said, son, you know, I played football when I was a kid. I really want you to play football too. Get up, grow up, get, you know, follow your old man's footsteps. Be a star just like I was. I really want you to play football too, but you're going to have to buy your own pads. And you're going to have to get your own helmet. And I'm not going to give you a ride to practice. And you're going to have to buy your own mouth guard and boil it yourself. I'm not going to sign any of the paperwork. I'm not going to sign any of the waivers. I'm not going to give the 25 bucks to the coach. But I really want you to play football. We wouldn't believe that dad, would we? Imagine if God said, you know what, I really want you to believe, but I'm not going to give you any help. I'm not going to give you anything. I'm not going to give you any means or source by which you can have the kind of faith that I seek for you to have. Thankfully, God is not that kind of God. God is a God who has given us what we need in order to have the faith that pleases him. This is something God has always done. Think about the ministry of Jesus, the miracles, the healing, the, the casting out of the demons. A large part of that was in order to cause or strengthen faith in others. Think about how Jesus went out of his way even sometimes to create faith in others, whether it was the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, where he purposefully waited for Lazarus to die so that he could go and call him out of the grave so that people would believe, John 11 tells us. We're familiar with Thomas. Sometimes we call him Doubting Thomas. Now, to be fair for him, everybody else, all of his other friends, all the other disciples of Jesus, saw something he didn't get to see, and he didn't believe their testimony about it. We're familiar with Thomas. He said, unless I can feel the wounds, unless I can see them, I will never believe. What does Jesus do? He appears for Thomas and says, feel the wounds. See that I am truly Jesus. And remember Thomas, his confession, he says, my Lord and my God. Think about Jesus' response, though. He says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Brothers and sisters, that's us. We have the greater portion of that blessing. Because we haven't seen the risen Jesus. We haven't seen the miracles, and yet we believe. God does not provide us with miracles today to create a rock-solid faith. He's provided us with his word. And sometimes, maybe not us, but some people want something more grandiose. They say, I'll believe if God appears to me in my bedroom tonight. And he says, hey, I really do exist. Jesus really is my son. The Bible really is my word. Believe. Then I'll believe. Some might say, I need to see my name written in the stars. I need to see a message that could have only come from God right in front of my face. Maybe Forrest. I exist. Sincerely, God that's the only way I'm going to believe. But sometimes we forget that the book of Hebrews tells us that that generation of Israel didn't enter the promised land because of their unbelief. Think about what that generation of Israel saw. They saw all of the ten plagues. They saw the Red Sea part before them and close after them to swallow up the Egyptian chariots. When they were hungry, they had manna. When they were hungrier, they had quail. When they were thirsty, water came out of a rock. And that wasn't enough for them to believe. 
But I think that if God stooped down on my level the way I wanted to happen and did some kind of miracle for me, then I would have faith. Let's not forget about the rich man who's being tormented in Hades and how he says, please, is there any way you can send somebody back to my brothers? Then they'll believe, then they'll repent, then they'll change. We know what Abraham says to the rich man. They have Moses and the prophets. If they won't believe God's word, if they won't believe what God has given to produce faith in the sons of men, then not even one raising, being raised from the dead could help them. In his infinite wisdom, God has given us his word to build an unshakable faith. And I hope that all of us will strive to make sure it is not the case that our faith is less than it should be because we haven't run to his word for refuge. That our faith is less than it should be because we haven't gone to his word ourselves and not been content just with the two sermons a week in the Bible class but actually going and feeding ourselves, not as babes in Christ, but those who are mature. You know, the only people who don't feed themselves are children, are babies. I remember the saddest day of my life. I asked my mom for a peanut butter jelly sandwich, and she said, Forrest, you're old enough to make one yourself. I'm glad she did that, though. But then I got married. And I've got a great wife who cooks some great food. And I'm thankful for those meals. But if my wife's sick or tired or out of town, I don't starve. I feed myself. We need to make sure we're feeding ourselves with God's word. That's where this all has to start. To believe that God's word is sufficient enough to create in us the faith God seeks. Certainly that is the case. So we're going to look at some verses, some other verses this evening. The first other than Romans 10, 17, is John chapter 8, verse number 32. Verses to build an unshakable faith. John chapter 8, verse number 32. We know this verse as well. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This verse gives us a beautiful fact, and that is that truth is objective, and truth is knowable. Truth is objective. That is to mean that there are truths out there that are true the same way for all people everywhere. Right? Jesus didn't say you will know a truth. You will know some truth. You will know your truth. You will know somebody else's truth. You will know the truth. Truth is objective and it's knowable. You won't guess the truth. You won't feel the truth. You will actually know the truth. One of the greatest threats to faith today in our nation, I think, in the church even, is the exaltation of what we sometimes refer to as postmodernism. We're familiar with it. It's saturated every, almost, every element of our society. This idea that you have your truth and I have my truth. And they could contradict and still be true. That's why we have people who have their truth and my truth. And though I am a biological male, it's my truth that I'm really a woman. That's postmodernism. It's all around us. What about agnosticism? The idea that we can't really know truth. That truth is just personal. That truth is just a matter of interpretation. That truth cannot really be known. That there is no absolute truth. We can see that that's self refuting. If you say there is no truth, of course, you could ask somebody, well, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? You've really painted yourself into a corner there. But good philosophy beyond that has told us that there are all kinds of truths we can know. We can know logical and mathematical truths, 2 plus 2 equals 4. We can know scientific truths. Maybe you remember this from Earth Science class. Fresh water at sea level freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We can know metaphysical truths, that is, truths about things that exist. For example, this pulpit exists. I don't think anybody here, hopefully, would be willing to debate, debate me on that topic. We know ethical truths. We know that the Nazis did something wrong. We can know what we sometimes call aesthetic truths, truths about beauty. If you say, well, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Well, I hope all of us husbands would agree that our wife is more beautiful than the family dog. You know that to be true. And if you don't know that to be true, you know that you are in the doghouse. But Jesus goes even further. He's not talking about 
philosophy generally. He's not talking about science. He's not talking about math. He's talking about religious truth. He says you can know religious truth. More than that, he doesn't say you can know religious truth. He says you will know religious truth if you abide in my word. You see, in this verse, we're reminded that religion and spirituality, according to Jesus, is not some enigmatic mystery where we just all have competing traditions and opinions and interpretations. We can know religious truth. We can know that the purpose of baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. We can know that God exists. We can know that Jesus is his son. We can know that Jesus rose from the dead. We can know that the Bible is true. We can know religious truths. I hope that we will not allow the world to create a crack in our faith so deep that we begin to think that we cannot know the truth. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you will. And if we abide in Jesus, we do. Instead of rejecting absolutes, we should embrace Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Moving on, the next verse we should have in our back pocket as a city of refuge to help build an unshakable faith is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 18. Again, a verse that might be familiar to us, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, that is the power of God. Brothers and sisters, how many of our brethren have fallen away because Christianity is just not the cool thing in society. How many brothers and sisters in Christ have turned their back on the Lord because they cannot stand up under the pressure of not having the majority opinion on some issue? How many brothers and sisters in Christ have fallen away because they are under the belief that they want to go with the flow? God built us as social creatures. We want to fit in. Sometimes the pressure can be overwhelming. I'm not saying that it can't be, but if our faith is contingent on the world acknowledging that Christianity is not foolish, our faith is not going to be rock solid. In the parable of the soils, Jesus talks about the rocky soil. He says, this is the one who has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. We should be very comfortable with the fact that the world is not going to admit that following God is a good idea. We should remember that before we were baptized, when we confessed our faith in Jesus, after we repented of our sins, that we had counted the cost. And when we were baptized, we made a commitment and we said, no matter what the world says, no matter what the world does, I'm acknowledging that the message of the cross, that the gospel is foolishness to the world. I wouldn't have it any other way. The things in this world are doomed for destruction. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Have you ever seen an atheist billboard? There's atheist organizations who spend tons of money to put billboards in big cities to try to spread atheism. In fact, there was one, I think, uh, just last decade that was put up in Knoxville. And it lasted five days before uh, it was too unpopular. They had to take it down. Listen to some of these atheist billboards. Atheist organizations, Freedom From Religion, other organizations, spend a lot of money. Listen to how great these arguments are for atheism. One billboard says, sleep in on Sundays. That's it. That's the extent of the billboard. There's another billboard that they put up that said, in the beginning, man created God. There's another billboard that they paid a lot of money to put up that just says this, God is imaginary, choose reality, it's better for all of us. You see, these aren't arguments, this isn't, this isn't anything other than trying to mock Christians, trying to make the social pressure so intense that you really think twice and think, man, maybe the Christianity thing is not for me. I want to fit in. We should want to fit in, but we should want to fit in with the right people. We should strive to fit in with those who are striving for godliness. When you feel belittled or mocked because of your faith, I hope you'll remember 1 Corinthians 1.18. That it's foolishness to those who are perishing. Church, we cannot derive our value from the opinion of godless sinners. That's not a rock-solid faith. That's a faith that's dependent upon the opinion of those who do not know God. 
Next, a Bible verse to help build an unshakable faith is Psalm 22. And I know what you're saying, Forrest, that's cheating. That's an entire psalm. I understand that, um, but I don't think anybody cares at this point. So Psalm 22. And if you turn there in your Bible and read verse number one, it's going to sound familiar to you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We're familiar with that. We're familiar with how Jesus cried that while he was on the cross. But Psalm 22 is a reminder that the Bible in and of itself contains evidence that the Bible is beyond mere human production, that the God of the Bible exists, that Jesus Christ is God's divine son and Messiah. We sometimes call these messianic prophecies. Psalm 22 is not the only one, but Psalm 22 is special. Think about Psalm 22 with me. If you would turn in your Bible, Psalm 22, we're going to just look at a few of these verses. Psalm 22 is attributed to David. I know sometimes the Bible timeline is difficult. David lived approximately 1,000 years before Jesus Christ. 1,000 years before Jesus was ever born, David wrote this psalm by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yet, Psalm 22, with significant, specific detail, tells us about the events surrounding the death of of Jesus Christ. Of course, in Psalm 22, verse number one, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The exact words proclaimed by Jesus on the cross in Matthew 27, verse 46. And a lot of ink has been spilled by theologians about why Jesus said that. I'm not convinced by some of the views that God literally forsook Jesus while he was on the cross. I think Jesus, surrounded by these Jews during this holy week, is trying to get them to think about Wait a second, I'm the one you read about in your scriptures. Think about Psalm 22. It's unfolding right in front of your face. In Psalm 22, verses 7 through 8, it mentions people mocking Jesus, mocking his suffering, shouting on him, shouting for God to save him. And this is fulfilled to a T in Jesus. In Matthew 27, in Mark 15, and Luke 23, all three synoptic accounts describe how passers-by and the Pharisees and the chief priests were at the foot of the cross mocking him, saying the exact same things Psalm 22 described. If you're really for God, let God come down and save you. Why doesn't he save himself? Why doesn't he come down from there? If you're really God's chosen one, why doesn't he help you? Psalm 22, 16 through 18 describes the sufferer being surrounded by enemies. It even goes as specific to say that his hands and his feet are pierced and that his clothing is gambled for, all uncannily fulfilled in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now the skeptic might say that these parallels are contrived, or sorry, contrived. I think that that's impossible. Psalm 22 is written a thousand years before Jesus. The oldest manuscripts we have of it were still centuries before Jesus was ever born. Well, so we know Psalm 22 was written before Somebody might say, well, maybe the events were made up. The events of Jesus were made up to match what is described in Psalm 22. But think about crucifixion. This, as Paul says in the book of Acts, this didn't happen in some corner somewhere. This was a public event. This was open for all to see. If they just made up details, if the gospel writers just made up details about Jesus' death to make it seem like it fulfilled Psalm 22... I don't think Christianity ever would have got off the ground. People would have said, wait a second, we were there. That's not how it happened. Don't believe them. Those who wrote the four Gospels did it independent of each other. They had nothing to gain by lying. No contemporary opponents of Christianity ever doubted that Jesus' crucifixion was an uncanny fulfillment of Psalm 22. And you might say, well, this is boring. I don't get it. But in this one chapter of the Bible, this one psalm, we have proof positive that the Bible is not just another dusty book on the shelf. We have proof positive that there is an intelligence beyond what any human could do. David's not smart enough to look down the hallway of history and see Jesus dying on the cross. We have proof positive that Jesus isn't just some Messiah, isn't just some guy claiming to be somebody, but that Jesus really is the son of the God of Israel. In Psalm 22, we have refuge to flee when we are doubting the inspiration of the Bible, the existence of God, or Jesus as the Messiah and God's Son. 
As time slips away from us, the next verse we are going to look at is Mark chapter 16, verse number 1. Mark chapter 16, verse number 1, and it seems like such an insignificant detail. It seems like almost just like filler, describing some things that are going on the day Jesus rose from the dead. But I hope that we'll see together that it's really much more than that. Mark chapter 16, verse number 1. And it simply says this. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. If you're familiar with the Bible, if you're familiar with the Gospel of Mark, you know that when they go to anoint Jesus on that Sunday after his crucifixion, he is not there. You know that it's these women who are the first to witness the risen Jesus and run and go and tell the other disciples. If you're a Christian, you probably know that Christianity stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There is no other option. Either Jesus rose from the dead and Christianity is true, or Jesus did not rise from the dead and Christianity is false. Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead, your faith is vain. Our preaching is in vain. You really haven't been forgiven of your sins. Everything hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But we have rock-solid historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection from the dead. It's not guesswork. It's not a leap of faith. It's not a conspiracy theory. God made it so evidently clear that reasonable people could conclude that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I would go as far to say that you can know that Jesus rose from the dead. Every gospel account confirms that women were the first witnesses of the risen Jesus in the empty tomb. Why is this significant? This is significant because in Jesus' day and Jesus' culture, the testimony of women was seen as especially weak. Listen to Josephus, an extra-biblical historian in his antiquities, commenting or offering commentary on the law of Moses. He says, let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. In other words, Josephus is saying is, you need two or three witnesses according to the law of Moses, but make sure none of them are women. Listen to the Talmud, which is a, a Jewish writing, really is a rabbinic tradition, commentary on Holy Scripture. The Talmud says in one place, any evidence when a woman gives is not valid to offer. That is, if a woman presents evidence for a case, you can't even submit it to the case. It doesn't count. Another place in the Talmud we read, there are some who declare that even a hundred women are regarded as equal to one witness. This is the way the ancient Jews, especially in Jesus' day, following their rabbinic tradition, would have viewed the testimony of women. In fact, in Luke 24, verse number 11, even the apostles at first didn't believe the women. They describe it as an idle tale. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for our faith? Here's the rub. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ is made up, if it's contrived, if it's a, a myth or a legend or a made-up story to fool people into believing a false religion, a group of women would not be the star witnesses. One Christian historian went as far to say, referring to the women who were the first witnesses, that the early Christians would never, never have made this up. Imagine if I was writing a story, contriving a story that was false, but I wanted to convince you that it was real. And I wanted to convince you that there was a banker who existed, who was extremely trustworthy. And I'm contriving this story so that you will believe it. And imagine that in my story, the banker's name is Bernie Madoff. How many of you would believe that this banker is a trustworthy guy? Probably none of us. Right? If I'm making up a story, trying to dupe you into believing that this banker is a trustworthy guy, I'm staying as far away from that name as I can. The fact that you have this, these women who were the first to see the risen Jesus, combined with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, that Jesus appeared to all the disciples, plus Barnabas, plus Paul, plus James, that there are over 500 witnesses who saw the risen Jesus at the same time, and that Paul says it's verifiable. He says, some of them are still alive. Why did he include that detail in 1 Corinthians 15? He's challenging the Corinthians, if you really doubt the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, go ask one of the guys who are still living who saw him with his own eyes. 
It's not hearsay. It's not opinion. It's not myth. It's not legend. There was not enough time for a legend to develop. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is not, like Peter says in his first epistle, is not a cleverly devised myth. It is a historical fact. In the gospel accounts of Jesus, we have corroborating, independent, eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection. The Apostle John says in 1 John, when he writes about Jesus, he's writing about things that his eyes have seen, that his ears have heard, that his hands have touched. You see, the, the most fundamental aspect, the bedrock of our faith, doesn't depend on some mystical event or some symbolic abstract idea the Christian faith rests in a historical fact. And before we turn our back on the Lord, we should really think long and hard about how we are going to explain the empty tomb of Jesus of Nazareth. We should think long and hard about how we're going to explain how Christianity even took off to begin with. How these monotheistic Jews are claiming that God has a son who is as much God as God the Father. And their evidence for it, if you read the book of Acts, is we saw him risen from the dead. Before we leave the faith, we should think long and hard about how we're going to explain that Saul of Tarsus, a real historical person, did an entirely 180 after seeing the risen Jesus from the dead. Brothers and sisters, I hope we can take solace in knowing that the foundational bedrock of our faith is not, is not hearsay, is not opinion, but in fact is fact. If you find yourself like this father in Mark chapter 9, if you were to cry out to God, I believe, help thou my unbelief, what would God do for us? He would encourage us to open his word, to be refreshed, to be reminded that we can know religious truth, that we can know that God exists, that we can know that the Bible is true, that we can know that Jesus is risen from the dead. Maybe you feel like that, Father. I believe, help thou my unbelief. Please do not ignore or tune out the message that God has given us. Brethren, I want to leave you with the words of our Lord in John chapter 20, verse 27. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. We have good reasons to do just that. Thank you for your time.